Members, would you please take your seat? It's now time for questions to the Minister for Health. Can I advise members that question seven has been withdrawn? And I call Chris Little. Question number one. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As the members are aware, mental health is one of my top priorities, and this includes delivering better child and adolescent mental health services or CAMS for people under 18. To do this, I will pursue a particular focus on prevention and early intervention. This will be done on a cross sectoral basis, particularly with colleagues in the education sector, to promote emotional mental well being in schools, educating our young people on their mental health, and strengthening the links between schools and mental health support services. In parallel with this, I also want to deliver investment to tackle long and unacceptable waiting lists so that our young people do not have to wait longer than nine weeks to see a CAMS professional. This, of course, will require the support of the Executive in the forthcoming budget process, and this additional investment will be used to address current workforce challenges in the sector and improve access to CAMS to ensure our young people get the help they need in terms of providing. In terms of providing CAMS, a particular focus on work will be leading the interdepartmental work on the action plan in response to the Children's Commissioner's still waiting report. Finally, in line with the new Decade New Approach Agreement, I will publish a mental health action plan by the end of March and a mental health strategy by December 2020. This will be informed by the findings of the Regional Children's Mental Health Prevalence Study due to report later this year and will set out the strategic direction and service requirements for CAMS over the next decade. In all of this work, I am fully committed to working in partnership with all relevant stakeholders to allow everyone to have their say in shaping what our mental health services will look like in the future. I call Chris Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will, of course, be aware of the level of anger across our community at the inadequate investment in mental health services for children and young people, and indeed a system that has been found by the Children's Commissioner to be under significant pressure, finding it difficult to respond to the scale of need and the complexity of issues with which children and young people are presenting. So can I ask the Minister what specific urgent actions he is taking to urgently improve the provision and investment of mental health resilience and suicide prevention services available to young people in Northern Ireland, and will he meet with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum on this matter? Thank you. Um, first of all, certainly in regards to meeting the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, I think they already have a question in. But in regards to the, to the specific actions, I am fully aware of the Nicky <coughs> report of the, the Commissioner for Young People and what actions and recommendations she has brought forward. We have not been able to fully scope all 50 of those recommendations into what our future men mental health strategy will look like. But uh, as I have said in my opening comments, funding for our CAM service is one of the major stumbling blocks that we have at this moment in time. The investment in CAMS is now over £20 million annu annually. That is actually double what it was 10 years ago. But this figure does not include investments made by the Public Health Agency in a wide range of children's services, such as family support services, safeguarding and primary care service. So, in addition, over half a million pounds of non-reoccurring investment from transformation money was made available to CAMS, specific projects in Northern Ireland in 1920. It is well recognised CAMS is underfunded, but I hope to address that in my tenure as Health Minister with support of Executive colleagues. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister, he mentioned in his, um, in his answer that he would be working with education, and that is very welcome and very appropriate. I am just wondering um, if the Minister wants to comment on, on any consideration he is given to working with the third sector. Uh, in terms of what help and support he can be to them so that they can be to him in this particular issue of mental health. And I thank the member for a question and I think the last comment is, is the critical bit is what help they can be to me as I can be to them. Because in regards to the mental health and well being of of Northern Ireland and our society in general. It is that interaction. It is joining the dots between voluntary and community, the department on service to providers to make sure we have a holistic approach to meet the needs. There is no simple fix across the challenges that we are facing at this minute in time. And that is why I think it is important that we have the involvement and buy in in the mental health strategy of all our sectors. So that is what I want to do in regards to, to reaching out and co production in and, and, and that process as we take it forward and recognise the value that they contribute to, to what we want to do as a department. I call Colin Gildenew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
thank you for the Minister for your, your answers to date there. Can I point out to the Minister that it has been raised in Health Committee around the lack of data relating to children's mental health in particular? And would the Minister please take account of that and see if he can urgently move to addressing the lack of data, as any forward planning will be dependent upon, upon good data? There are also concerns around data transfer post Brexit, and that the Minister maybe also consider those issues. Um, you know, I, I thank the Chair for, for his comments here and, and the question specifically into to how data will be managed in regards to Brexit. That is an issue that we are looking at across the entire Department and Health Service because it is something that will affect not just the, the mental health well-being of our young people, that is where the question started out of, but all, all sections of, of our mental health system. In regards to the data, we are clarifying as to how exactly that can be quoted correctly across all the department and all the departmental structures to make sure that we recognise and identify those issues collectively, because we are aware that the coding maybe isn't pulling all the data that we need together, and I think that's something that was actually raised in the committee that the chairman noted. I call Claire Sugden. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, last week a young constituent told me that when trying to access the CAMS crisis team, she was told that um, they only provided services for up to 17 years old, and nor could she access the adult uh, crisis services. Now, if this is indeed the case, it gives me great cause for concern that there is a gap of a year where we are not addressing crisis of, of 17 to 18 year olds. I would be just keen to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I, I do not know the specific case that the member has, but if she wants to ask for a meeting outside, we will we'll take that on as a I can, as a single issue and raise it with the CAM support team. I would be surprised if there is a gap between 17 to 18 because I know it's some need in special education and needs that transfer between those age groups is something that's taken very seriously. Um, if the member wants to raise that specific issue, I'll look at it with her. Moving on, I call Kelly Armstrong. Question number two, please. Minister. Thank, and again, I thank the, the member for her question. Um, a review of gender identity services is currently underway in order to identify a new model of care for transgender and non-binary people in Northern Ireland. As part of this process, a gender identity service pathway review group has been established. Membership of the group includes officials from my department, um, the Health and Social Care Board, Public Health Agency, Patient and Client Council and the Royal College of General Practitioners and service users' representatives. The group is, of course, aware of the declassification of gender identity issues as a mental health problems in the 11th edition of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, and will be mindful of this in taking its work forward. The group is due to report on its findings and recommendations by June 2020. Trans and non-binary people also experience many of the same health problems as the rest of the population. Therefore, it is their condition and unrelated to gender dysphoria or its treatment, they will be treated in the same way as any other patient with that condition. I call Kelly Armstrong for supplementary. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, Minister, I just want to clarify on that, that review panel. Um, I'm very aware that there are representatives um, of trans persons on that panel. However, the criteria was never published to pick who those people were. And what I would ask, as comes out of New Decade, New Approach, is that in the light of civic engagement and public consultation, that um, other organisations such as Transgender NI may be involved in that review and ask the Minister if he would possibly meet with Transgender NI. Um. I thank the member for, for her, her supplementary and going from the, the last part first. Um, I have um, I've written out and I will be inviting all members uh, or a number of organisations to an LGBTQ plus roundtable at the end of March. And to my knowledge, Transgender NI is one of those organisations. In regard to her earlier point, it's something I hope uh, organisations have been asked to identify to the department what they want to discuss at that round table. So if they make that as a priority, as an issue that they want to raise, it's something we will consider at that point. I call Tarn McKinnon. Uh, last can call you, and I thank the Minister for his response. I would be quite shocked at that meeting with transgender NI and others at the issue of conversion therapy and the need to bring legislation forward to ban it wasn't raised. So has the Minister any plans to bring forward legislation to ban the inhumane practice of conversion therapy? Um, I, 
I will be honest with you, this is the first time the issue actually has been raised with me as Minister. If it's something that has, is brought up or is brought up at the round table, it's something that we'll definitely consider. But saying the member has raised it here today, it's something we'll, we'll put in our, in our work scope as thing to do, and I'll give her that commitment. Before I move on to the next question, I'd like to advise members that question five has been withdrawn. I call Robin Newton. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for his question. As he is aware, general practice is a crucial part of our health service and is the first point of contact for the majority of people accessing health and social care. Although the number of GP practices in Northern Ireland has reduced from 350 in 2014 to 327 in 2019, there were only five practice closures in that period. The remaining 18 practices were part of mergers with larger practices in order to ensure longer-term sustainability. In most cases, these mergers offer patients an increased range of services with access to multi-professional workforce, including new roles such as practice-based pharmacists and advanced nurse practitioners. To minimise disruption to patients where the Health and Social Board received notice of a potential closure, it takes all necessary steps to secure the continuation of GP services. This includes advertising the contract widely and liaising with local practices who may wish to operate an additional surgery. Patients are kept informed throughout this progress. To address GP workforce challenges, we are also working hard to support the recruitment and retention of GPs. The number of GP training places has been significantly increased over the last few years, from 65 in 2015 to 111 in 2019. Initiatives are also in place to support GPs to return or remain in general practice through the GP Induction and Refresher Scheme and the GP Retainer Scheme. The induction and refresher scheme aims to provide support to GPs returning to or entering clinical practice in Northern <coughs> Ireland by ensuring that GPs who have not worked in clinical general practice for 24 months or more and those who have not previously worked in general practice in the UK can be appropriately inducted and have the necessary skills for the provision of general medical services. At the end of January 2020, eight doctors had completed the induction and refresher scheme in 2019-20, year to date, with a further three currently completing the scheme. Finally, through the transformation process, we are reshaping primary care services. The rollout of multidisciplinary teams is delivering new capacity and innovation into primary care, bringing service, services closer to our communities and improving access for all our citizens. We are delivering MDTs in every trust area, improving physiotherapy, mental health support and social workers. MDTs are a cornerstone of our plans to transform the health service and will make an important contribution to the long-term sustainability of general practice. Can I remind the Minister that it is two minutes for an answer and he can request an extra minute if he feels it is a particularly important issue that he needs longer. Can I call Robin Newton for a supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, and indeed, uh, although the Minister has taken that little bit of extra time, the fact that he has uh, indeed delved into the matter and has that very detailed answer, I, I welcome that uh, response. I, I have to say, though, uh, Mr. Speaker, that in terms of convincing uh, certainly my constituents that indeed all the coming together of the uh, practices has been to their advantage uh, would take and some convincing the when they have to make appointments or cannot get appointments uh, except over a prolonged period of time. No, and I, I, I thank the member for a supplementary and I, and I think that is something we have to do by recruiting the number of GPs. As I said, the number of practices has not reduced greatly, but it is getting more GPs into the service and also the multidisciplinary teams. When somebody who is funding a GP practice might not necessarily need to be seen by the doctor, whereas a community far or the pharmacist or the physiotherapist or even a health, health, a mental health specialist may be the better, better approach for, the, for their continuation of care. So the GP may, somebody may, might think they need to see the GP, but with the multidisciplinary team, there may be another service professional in there that's better placed to support them. So, by the, by the introduction and expansion of multidisciplinary teams, we hope to, to try to address that problem. I call Martina Anderson. In the context of increasing the supply of GPs and also 
in the context of tackling regional inequalities west of the band. You will be aware that there is growing frustration in Derry about the expansion of McGee University, and you know that there is an outline business case on your desk, and I know you have been looking for further clarification of that. So could I ask you, where are you with regards to giving consideration to move in that issue of the expansion of McGee? Because we would like to address the frustration in Derry, but primarily we want to get the medical school in McGee move forward. Okay, and I, I thank the member for, for, for her question, specifically in re regards to the medical school in McGee and where we are. Um, I do not have the full business case in front of me because we met with Robin Walker, the junior NIO minister, the week before last to clarify where the money is promised and you take a new approach actually applies to revenue and capital in regards to the McGee Business School. So we are seeking clarifications in that and where the monies can be aligned. But you will also be aware that the medical school, whether as part of my rebate we are looking at, there is also cross-sectoral uh, departmental input from the Department of the Economy and the wider expansion to McGee. But I can assure in regards to the medical school in McGee and the provision of GPs and the, the post-degree qualifications that people can actually come into that medical school is something that we are looking at very, very seriously because it will address, in, in our opinion, some of the GP shortages that we are currently facing. I call Rosemary Barton. Is the Minister aware of the particular challenges of recruiting and retaining sufficient numbers of GPs in Fermanagh and South Tyrone? Um, you know, and I think, uh, and follow on from the, minute, the question that has already been asked, it, there is a problem, especially, I suppose, felt in Fermanagh, the shortage of GPs right across the country. However, given the rural nature of the members' constituency and the prominence of small GP practices, uh, which actually cover large rural communities and populations, I recognise there are particular challenges in the county, and it's something I hope the significant increase in GP training places as well as McGee will address. I call Colin McGrath. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the uh, Minister did make reference to closures and uh, the amalgamation of some practices. Is there some specific work that can be done to ensure and mitigate against those closures, as is mentioned, in the rural areas where such a closure would have a greater impact as people would have to travel further to be able to move if services are centralised or closed? And in regards to, I suppose, that specific question in, in the rural community and, and access to a GP, um, when we look at the mergers of GP practices, they are private contractors at that point in time. So, whereas we have some input and interaction as to signposting patients and how the best care prov provision is actually delivered, where they locate, while we can not have an influence, but we can't direct as to where those services could be. But the, mem the member's point is well made. But it's also how we expand the multidisciplinary teams into our rural practices as well. Because it is difficult to, uh, as the, the members have previously, retain GPs in rural constituencies. So it's how we bring in those other health professionals, as I said, and all the physiotherapists, community pharmacists, and all the rest of it, to make sure that the service they're being provided in their GP surgery is actually one that delivers in a timely fashion. Moving on, I call Catherine Kelly. Glass Ken Corya, Cash Dever Kahar, question four. Okay, um, and again, I, I thank the member for her question. Um, I may require an extra minute for this, Speaker. Uh, the development of a new oral health strategy would carry significant resource and cost, and in the context of the range of financial pressures facing health and social care, it has not been possible in the past years to identify funding for that. But that said, my Chief Dental Officer's professional view is that most of the 2007 oral health strategy remains fit for purpose given the current evidence base on cost-effectiveness of available interventions and available funding. And we're making excellent progress in some of those key areas, and I think that's important to stress today. For example, recently emerging data for five-year-old children provides evidence of further significant improvement in respect of the relevant oral health strategy targets. One target that was set was to improve the length 39 per cent of five-year-old children who were decay-free to a level of 50 per cent in 10 years. In 2013, the data indicated that we had achieved, that, achieved actually the figure of 60 per cent of five-year-olds five, five who were decay-free. And the emerging data from 1819 indicates that 70 per cent of our five-year-old children are actually decay-free. 
There have also been very significant additional improvements in terms of the severity of dental disease in this age group of children. Another oral health strategy target aimed to improve upon the relevant technical metric by a threshold of 24% in 2013, and data has highlighted that we've got a 44% improvement. And the latest data appears to indicate that there will be a further 18% improvement has been achieved since then. These are notable successes, successes, especially given the many regional differences we face at a UK level that enable England to generally achieve better child oral health outcomes. But the work continues. Uh, my Chief Dental Officer has established oral health options groups to allow for the consideration and development of for, for further oral health policy options for the two most urgent groups at present, which are namely children and the elderly. In parallel with this, I will continue to pursue additional funding for this important area. I call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Um, and I'm glad that um, there is a group there working for children and young people, because that was part of my um, supplementary. Um, just on what you said about the, about the strategy being fit for purpose, um, can I ask um, if you could outline how it is still fit for purpose when the data within it is 17 years old? Uh, and I, th I thank the member for a for, for question. As, as I said, in, in regards to, to the feedback I've heard from the, the Chief Dental Officer, it's, it's where we target the resource we have at the minute, both, both physical and monetary. Um, Two of the main targets in that area, as I said, were younger people and older people, and, and I gave the, the, the specific measure of where we're improving children's dental health. Um, so where we want to, I, I suppose our Chief Dental Officer wants to focus is on the two, those two groups, and these groups will allow the faster delivery of outputs, um, so allow, allowing for, and I suppose, look, forgive the point, you know, for a better bite-sized approach, so we can actually look at the, the, those two groups. Uh, and the representatives that we've been engaging with include hospital specialists, professional representation from clinicians and general dental practice and the community dental service representatives from my department and the board. While I mentioned the younger people, the elderly group, the changing ageing demographic in our population already prevents challenges with inevitably ever-increasing needs upon our health and social care. People are actually retaining more of their teeth and people um, for longer, which represents a significant oral health improvement over the actual decades. Whilst many in older age can maintain and enjoy good oral health, there is a need for a higher service provision for a frail elderly population. And my officials are aware of the issue, and elderly op the elderly options group will help develop possible measures. So it's taking the strategy piece by piece, rather than developing an entire new strategy that we're working on on the basis at the minute. And can I remind members to continue to rise in their place if they wish to be called? I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Minister. And you've actually touched on in, in what, um, what I have intended to ask you. But I think, uh, Minister, can you be more specific in relation to the efforts being made to encourage the uptake of dental care, particularly for the older? This cohort is uh, particularly um, at risk of difficulties with oral cancer, which can have absolutely devastating effects, not just on the person that has it, but the, the wider families uh, and that uh, Can the member come to request? Okay. Uh, and, and no, I, I'm, I'm conscious my, my answer did cover, cover the member's questions, but she did raise, I think, a very important topic. Whereas we usually look at our dentists looking solely at teeth and fillings, the, the issue of oral cancer is actually our dentists are a key frontline defence for identifying that early, so it's recognising the larger contribution that our dentists actually pay to our health service here in Northern Ireland. As I said, in regards to, to the older group, we're also, there's also additional challenges as dementia becomes more prevalent, the further challenges that puts on dentists actually dealing with those patients. So, so the, the dental profession is changing as to what I would have knew it as a child or where most of us would have knew it as a child, so they're becoming a more integral part to our health service and the provision that they provide. I call Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, Minister, uh, the 
Uh, well, st statistics and the progress that you outlined in terms of oral health there are very encouraging. And I think you just touched upon it last time there in terms of the, the key role that our community dentists can play in this. So given the growing pressures on our independent dental contractors, are you minded to review the current health service dental fees? As again, as I said, I think to previous members, it's not something that's currently on my table at this minute in time, but as the member has raised it, I'm sure it will be now on my officials' radar, so the member has made her point, and I'm sure her leader's husband will be particularly keen. I don't think he's a dentist as well. <laughs> Moving on, I call John Stewart. Please, Mr Speaker. Um, I thank the member for his question. GP federations are community interest companies established and owned by GPs. Although they are relatively recent addition to primary care, they have very quickly made a hugely valuable contribution to supporting GPs and improving primary care services. And I understand that the East Antrim GP Federation has been working positively with local health and social care partners in the Northern area to deliver better services for patients in that area. For example, the Federation is delivering a proactive nursing home service which has been running since October 2018. This service provides anticipatory care for nursing home residents, reducing inappropriate emergency department attendances and hospital admissions. Further practices within the Federation are also participating in the Primary Care Paediatric Hub, which seeks to link up primary and secondary care clinicians to provide high quality care for children and families. It is clear that this approach is making a significant and positive impact in the health service and crucially to the lives of patients. I am clear that partnership working right across the system is the best way to deliver the transformation we all want to see. And it's equally clear that a strong network of GP federations can play a crucial part of that process. And I would like to take this opportunity to record my thanks for the important work of the East London GP Federation and indeed all our federations. I call John Stewart for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and very much welcome his uh, positive assessment of the East Antrim GP Federation to date, embedding pharmacists into the GP practices. Can the Minister provide an update on the rollout of practice based pharmacists, please? And again, uh, I thank the Member for his question. Uh, the practice based pharmacist initiative has been rolled out through the GP federations, including the East Antrim Federation. Um, the GP federations are acting as employers rather than individual practices, and this has enabled a network of pharmacists to be established that can deliver a resilient, sustainable service. This also provides a support network for pharmacists to share and learn from best practice. Practice-based pharmacists play an important role in releasing GP time spent on prescribing activities, which increase overall GP capacity. They are working with GPs to improve the quality and safety of prescribing and secure efficiencies in the primary care prescribing budget. As well as important patient care, the initiative is a key enabler of transformation in general practice and enables pharmacists to make greater use of their clinical skills as part of the multidisciplinary team. In terms of the numbers that are currently in place, 274 practice-based pharmacists are in post and a further wave of recruitment is due, is due during 2020, which will increase this to 330. Moving on, I call Declan McAleer. Okay, and I, I thank the member for his question. My department is ad adhering to the statutory requirements in relation to the public involvement and consultation set out in the Health and Social Care Reform Act, Northern Ireland 2019, <coughs> and the policy position set out in the Regional Co-Production Guide for Health and Social Care, Connect and Realising Value Through People. As described in my department's guide, working together in partnership is about realising value through people. It is about identifying and harnessing the different skills, experience and expertise residing with individuals and the communities they live in to build the two truly representative networks that can deliver real and positive change. We are all aware that how health and social care is provided here must change, and that means there are difficult choices to be made. But for example, how to balance demand and prioritise service in the midst of financial constraints and how to balance local accessibility with the quality of care which can be provided. I am committed to using existing mechanisms and to seek out new ways of working to connect those providing health and social care, those with lived experience of that care and their families and carers, policy makers and local communities to the planning, delivery and evaluation of those services. 
co-production is integral into all the planning for transformation of hospital services. For example, the Daisy Hill Pathfinder, the review of urgent emergency care and day case elective care centres. The cancer strategy is also currently being taken forward through co-production. And I have confidence that by truly putting people at the heart of making decisions and choices about services and providing a direct link to the designing and planning of those services at a strategic level, we will achieve the improvements and experiences and outcomes we need to transfigure health and the social care provision. And that is the end of our time for listed health questions. And we now move on to topical questions. Can I advise members that uh, topical question number four has been withdrawn? And I call Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, Gourmet, I would ask you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he could update the Chamber and members in relation to his department's preparation in response to the ongoing spread of the coronavirus? And I, I thank the member for, for his question. And if I could, Speaker, I may take a wee bit more time with this because I am aware of the importance that, that this issue actually is. And, and I thank the, the Chair of the Health Committee as well for his interaction and support while we have dealt with this over the past few weeks. Um, my department has set up an emergency operations centre and has updated, updated relevant websites with advice for members to the public. A helpline for coronavirus has been established in Northern Ireland to provide advice for those who may have concerns following a visit to China and the now expanded region in the last 14 days. It operates a 24 hours a day call centre. And it's, the number is 0300 555 0119. And the Chief Medical Officer has, always, has also issued letters providing guidance to clinical staff on what to do if they encounter patients with respiratory infections arising from overseas. And my department, along with other public health agencies, remain in regular contact with the relevant authorities across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to ensure any necessary precautions are in place in Northern Ireland in response to this situation. I have also updated my executive colleagues, and do so weekly, and have their full support and commitment for dealing with this issue. I have asked my officials to consider what additional public health legislation may be of benefit in our efforts to contain the future spread of the novel coronavirus in Northern Ireland. And my department will continue to remain in contact with officials in the Republic of Ireland and work closely with officials and public health colleagues in the event of the case on the island of Ireland. A joined up approach to communications remains vital. We have been working closely, closely with our PHA and communications teams throughout the four nations to ensure we are sending out a clear, coordinated and consistent message across the United Kingdom. I call John O'Dowd for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer and also for the number of written statements he has issued to members over this last period of time. And indeed, I am aware of his cooperation with the Health Committee. Would he agree with me that information is crucial at this stage uh, and that as much information we can get out to the public and the correct information going out to the public? Because the last thing we want is misinformation and rumours and uh, the spread of misinformation is quite dangerous. So I would encourage the Minister to continue issuing information to members and also to the general public. And, and I thank this member for that. And I, I think the phrase he used, the correct information, because the last thing we want to avoid is, is a, a scare or a public, public health scare. And, and I would stress and I would say this to, to members of the House, uh, we do need to be careful that we do, don't stigmatise the Chinese community here in Northern Ireland at this minute in time, because it would be very easy and very dangerous to do that. At this minute in time, there are no reported cases here in Northern Ireland, and I think as long as we can maintain that, it will be beneficial to us. But I would stress to members, it is a matter, I think, of when, not if. But at this minute in time, the work that we are doing, along with our colleagues in the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, that so far we have been able to re resist, or, or we haven't had a positive case. But as I said, it's probably a matter of time rather than anything else. But our information that we're getting out there is crucial, and it is important that members, or, or people in the general public, if they do have or they think they have symptoms, do contact the helpline. I call Carney Killian. Gormel, good last can call you. Um, thank the minister uh, for his questions and his answers. Or sorry, his answers to questions. Even if he has taken an extra minute, I actually think it's worthwhile so people get the right information. So, with that said, uh, I, the question I want to ask the Minister is really in relation to the NICE guidelines, particularly for drugs and their availability for sufferers of cystic fibrosis. 
and those that have been recently cleared by NICE that are now part of treatment and those waiting to be cleared by NICE, if the Minister has those answers to hand. Um, I do know this is an issue the member has written to me about in, in specific cases on specific drugs. In regards to NICE and accessing um, certain medications, there is, there is procedures within the department that they can apply for specific funding for individual cases, and I'll forward that infor case, inf information to the member if she feels, this, if she feels it would be, would be helpful without going into specific any of the drugs that she, she hasn't mentioned at this moment in time. It would be remiss of me to start to name individual drugs at this point in time that either have nice claims or don't have nice claims, because I don't have that information to in front of me. I call Carla Killeen for a supplementary. Um, it's Nick Hillen. Nick Hillen. Okay, Gormagut. So, if a minister doesn't mind, could he could he do that? Because I appreciate it's a lot of information to be bounced on topical questions. And could he also just take this opportunity to scotch any rumours that once a, a medical practitioner, a doctor, a consultant, recommends a patient for drugs, that they're recommending them for that treatment on? A health social care budget, and that families aren't left to foot the bill, even if some of the drugs companies have given the, the license just on compassionate grounds, waiting nice approval. It's just that there is a lot of speculation out there, and I think we need to clear that up, and particularly through the cystic fibrosis trusts and patient and client uh, councils as well. And I, I think the clarity that the, the member has, see, has made as well as, as well made. Um, I'll get back to her with specific guarantees and advice on that specific issue rather than me giving you a verbal here. I, I want to get it in the correct terminology so the member has that to pass on to her constituencies and, and those organisations that are campaigning to access drugs that aren't currently listed by NICE but are also covered, um, or, or the other medications that are covered by NICE that may be accessible through prescription through the consultant or a specific GP. And I call Doug Beatty. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he gives an update on the consultation um, on breast assessment services? I can't. Um, no, I, I thank the member um, for the question and actually what is a, a very critical um, assessment and piece of work that the Department has been doing um, through the term that we actually haven't been in place. Um, we are aware that the need to reform breast assessment services is clear. A shortage of specialist staff and a growing demand for breast assessment services uh, due to the ageing population. Um, and this has resulted in uneven performance across the five trusts, despite the best efforts of our hard-working staff. Action is needed to address the vulnerability of the current system and make this servant more resilient to both current and future demand. The public consultation on reshaping breast assessment services closed on 30 August 2019, with over 4,600 written responses received. My officials have now completed the consultation and analysis, and once I have carefully considered all of the evidence presented to me, I intend to announce my decisions on the way forward, and I will, of course, update the House in due course. I call Doug Beatty for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his uh, response. and He will be well aware that the assessment centre in Craig Avenue Area Hospital in my constituency uh, has featured heavily in, in that uh, consultation. Uh, and He will also be aware uh, that I have asked to meet with him, along with um, the fantastic charity Knitted Knockers, um, who makes handmade um, uh, breast prosthetics uh, for women who have had mastectomies and, and breast operations. Uh, could I ask if he could facilitate that meeting with myself and them? And uh, as far as I'm aware, there, there is a written request in, and I will facilitate the meeting with the member on and the members of Knitted Noggers as soon as he can, as soon as he can bring them forward and contact my office. Call Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We'll all have seen and heard uh, reports of the pressures facing our emergency departments across the north. I wonder if the minister could give the house an ass his assessment of our uh, emergency departments. Out of waiting times. Um, and I thank the member for his topical. And again, Deputy Speaker, if, if I go over the, the, the lot of time, I regret it. Because I do deeply regret that some patients have at excessively long waits in emergency departments, and the current waiting times are simply not acceptable. 
I am fully aware of the intense pressure that staff and our emergency departments continue to work under, and I have absolutely no doubt that we have an excellent staff working in very challenging environments. I want to pay tribute to all our staff of the health and social care system, and in particular those staff who have had to face increased demands on our emergency departments in all of our hospitals, and who continue to do their best in extremely difficult circumstances. Emergency departments continue to experience significant pressures, and there is also an increase in the complexity of conditions presenting at emergency departments, particularly amongst the growing frail and elderly population. The increase in demand for emergency care that we have seen in recent years illustrates the mounting pressure with the health and social care sectors coming under and reinforces the need for change and transformation of the system. We need to reduce waiting times, but also to put in place solutions that will make the service sustainable in the longer term, and this will be one of my key priorities as Minister. As the Member may be aware, my Department is currently undertaking a clinically-led review of urgent and emergency care across the region, but seems to establish a sustained regional care, care model which will fit the next 10 to 15 years. And it is expected that an initial report will be ready for my consideration early this year. But I want to reassure those who say they are losing faith in our system that the members of the health and social care system are working hard, and we are working hard to restore that confidence. Call Mark Durden for uh, oh, I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for that answer and echo, echo his praise of our heroic health uh, workers. Uh, could the Minister uh, inform the Assembly of any plans to extend and improve the emergency department at Alton Galton Hospital in my own constituency? Um, no, and I thank the member um, for his question. He is probably not aware I actually visited the A&D and Alton Galton last week along with the care service. So I saw at first hand the fantastic work they are doing, but also and I see John Dallet nodding in the background because I visited the cancer centre as well. Um, but the pressure that was on ED even in that time on a Wednesday afternoon was considerable with our ambulances as well waiting there to discharge, to discharge patients. patients. Um, my officials have been working on a long-term capital planning for the health and social care service, and as part of that process they have asked all health and social care trusts to put forward their, their key priorities. The Western Health and Social Care Trust has been developing an outline business case for Alton Gallivan Phase 5.2 to include theatres, accident and emergency, and outpatients. This is planned to take forward in two phases, 5.2a and 5.2b. Um, the capital cost of the project is currently to be expected in the region of £110 million, with an additional revenue of £13 million per annum to enable them to open it. It is something that was pressed on me by the Chief Executive of the Trust when I made the, the visit. That business case and the outline business case has been worked on and as soon as it is presented that everything else will be in the mix, and I will be looking forward to executive colleagues supporting the financial bid. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what plans or what is he putting in place to cover the 3,000 job vacancies in nursing positions right across Northern Ireland? Um, the, the Member will be aware that um, our shortage of nurses is one of the, the, the key challenges. Um, that, we, that we do face in, 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 in our general health service, because nurses are now no longer just nurses on the ward. They are part of our GP services. Nurses are the, the critical link that are facing. So why we think the, the challenge we have in bringing our numbers back up to date is something that we are looking to address, as the member will be aware. It is part of the recurring process where we asked for an extra 900 places as part of New Decade, New Approach and how we bring that forward in conjunction with the relevant trade unions and, and bodies as well. We are currently training 1,025 nurses per year, so we have got an extra 300 nurses over the next three years. We should be providing 1,325, but it is not about just bringing new nurses into the system. Like I said earlier on in an earlier answer about getting GPs to come back into practice, we also have to look for those support mechanisms that bring nurses back into practice and back into our health service so that they can provide the support and critical care that they need or they provide to our, our patients. Alex Easton. Um, can I ask the Minister and thank him very much for the answer. Are lessons being learned about all these positions that aren't being filled? And is there an answer as to why that has actually happened and that we don't let it happen in the future because it has a knock on effect on the likes of outpatient appointments and so on? Um, 
as, as I said in, in, in the answer, uh, I'm fully aware of the critical role that the nurses play, and I suppose in the engagement that I've had with their trained union representatives uh, in bringing the, the industrial action to, to, to a satisfactory close, the support I had with, with all, the, all their executive colleagues. But one of the things that the nurses were put forward at that point in time, it wasn't just about pay, it was also about safe staffing and how they're supported and enhanced in their role. So there's work that has been done on that. We also have an independently led Sir Richard Barnett, the former Vice Chancellor of Ulster University, has led a piece of work in regards to nursing and midwifery review, which has come forward with a number of recommendations as to how we support our nurses and midwives as critical 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 components within the workforce. So that report is, is due to come back very shortly and was pu probably published in the next two or three months with Sir Richard's recommendations as to how we actually value and support our nurses as part of that workforce. And that is the end of our time of questions to the Minister for Health. And we now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. And can I advise members that questions 5 and 11 have been withdrawn? And I call Andrew Muir. Number one, Mr Deputy Speaker.